almost a thousand participants. I am Maan Barnachea, one of the volunteers of God of the Focolare Movement. Maayong buta, namaste. I am Gio Francisco, one of the young people of the Focolare Movement and a student of this university. We would like to recognize our friends from different parts of the Philippines, India, and the rest of the world who are following the program via live stream. It is our pleasure to welcome you to today's celebration, the 25th anniversary of the conferment of the Honorary Doctorate in Sacred Theology to the Servant of God, Clara Lubick, by the University of Santo Tomas, the Catholic University in the Philippines, and the oldest university in Asia. This event was very significant since Chiara was the first and only woman and lay person upon the unanimous endorsement of the entire Catholic Bishops' Conference of the Philippines to receive the honorary degree or the honoris causa in sacred theology. Do we have a show of hands of those who were present during that occasion? Anyone? Ah! Wow. wow! Welcome to this beautiful reunion! I was a very young girl then, Gio, but I remember how festive it was. Everyone was smiling, and I remember there was even a band playing as Chiara with Father De La Rosa were walking into this very auditorium. Wow! As for me, I was only a few months old then, so I didn't really have the same experience. <laughs> but you're right, this was the very auditorium where Chiara received the honorary degree in 1997. And today, we finally found the opportunity to celebrate the silver anniversary. And so, we are honored to be graced by the presence of each one, especially His Excellency, the Most Reverend Charles John Brown, Apostolic Nuncio to the Philippines, and the Dean of the Diplomatic Corps, representatives of the CBCP, and leaders of the Christian churches, world religions, civic groups, and government officials. To read the welcome message of the Rector Magnificus, the Reverend very Reverend Father Richard Ann O.P., we are happy to have on stage Reverend Father Pablo Tiong of the Order Preachers, Vice Rector for Religious Affairs of the Pontifical and Royal University of Santo Tomas. His Excellency, Most Reverend Charles Brown, Apostolic Nuncio, Their Excellencies, Most Reverend Jose Pablo, Archbishop of Cebu, Most Reverend Gerardo Almenaza, Bishop of San Carlos, Most Reverend Leopoldo Haushan, Bishop of Banguet, most Reverend Roberto Magliari, Bishop of San Jose. Most Reverend Deogracias Iniguez, Bishop Emeritus of Calaucan. Reverend Father Rolando de la Rosa, OB, former Rector of UST. Ms. Sherin Ann Meneses and Reverend Father Andrew Camilleri, co-delegates of Focolare to all Focolarini assembled in this gathering, guests 
and fellow admirers of the Apostle of Dialogue, Chiara Lupic. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Today, we commemorate the 25th year of the conferment of an honorary doctorate in sacred theology of Chiara Lupic on March 12, 1997. To those who are unfamiliar with this recognition, honorary degrees are conferred by the University of Santo Tomas to the distinguished, to distinguished individuals to honor their contributions within a specific field or to society in general. Among the illustrious recipients, this would include Cardinal Francis Arinze, Doctor of Humanities, 2001. His Excellency Eduardo Frey, Doctor of Political Science, 1995. And Juan Carlos de Bourbon, Doctor of Laws, 1974. Unknown to many, Chiara and her friends founded the movement when she was just 23 years old in the war-torn city of Trent in 1943. Today, the movement is present in more than 180 countries, promoting unity through ecumenical and interreligious dialogue. It is not surprising that the name Focolare has become synonymous with dialogue. And no less than St. John Paul II called the members of the movement Apostles of Dialogue. In his message to Miss Chiara Rupi, on the occasion of the 60th anniversary of the Focolare movement, St. John Paul II described her contribution to the world with the following words, I quote, In unison with the magisterium of the Church, the members of the Focolare movement have become apostles of dialogue, the privileged way to promote unity, dialogue within the Church, ecumenical and interreligious dialogue, and dialogue with non-believers way back in 2003. As describing Chiara's exemplary life, Pope Francis emphasized the significance of unity. In his message during the centenary birth anniversary, he said, the charism of unity is one of these graces of our time, which is experiencing a momentous change and calls for a simple and radical spiritual and pastoral reform, which brings the Church back to the ever new and current source of the Gospel of Jesus. Chiara's vision of a united world, a world of communion, fraternity, and peace, is the exemplar of her charism, which developed and matured against the backdrop of the catastrophic Second World War. In one of her writings, she recounts, I quote, in the midst of the raging war, I carried it with me, referring to the gospel that she kept with her every day, into the bomb shelters and read it together with my friends. We were surprised to find that those words that we had heard so many times in the past acquired deep meaning, unusual splendor. They shone out as if a bright light 
illuminating each one. They were different from other words, even those found in the best spiritual men. They were universal and therefore directed to everyone. Young people, adults, men, women, Italians, Koreans, Ecuadorians, Nigerians. Indeed, they were written with such artistry that people felt compelled to put them into practice. Well, the whole gospel attracted us to the point that we took it as the role, as the rule of our new movement that like today we can say that charism led us to underline and make our own, especially those sentences that would become the key ideas of a new spirituality in the church. The spirituality of unity. Through the historic confirmation of the honorary degree of Chiara in 1997, UST was made an instrument by the Holy Spirit to set a model for our young students to experience in a special way how the love of Jesus grows a hundredfold globally through the charism of unity in the life and work of the servant of God, Chiara Lubick. Along this line, I wish to highlight three points. The first point is the conversion through a constant reading of the Bible. According to her, her daily readings of the Gospel led her to mature in faith and ignite her missionary zeal for, of working for unity. In our generation, we are fortunate that the spread of Biblia Rasal in the campus brought our students to encounter the scriptures through study and prayer, which opens up spaces towards deepening the youth's spirituality by listening, reflecting, and sharing the Word of God. The second point is the charism of unity. Kayara, Kayara draws people together from various cultures, races, and religions of all ages. The Focolari movement imbibes what Pope Francis would call the culture of encounter, promoting a dialogue of religious experience and action, and supporting the inclusion of young people. Wherefore, it provides a faithful response to the exhortation of Pope Francis in Christus Vivid when he said, we need to make more room for the voices of young people to be heard. The third point is the unity with the magisterium of the church. The university's profound admiration and closeness with Chiara Lubick springs from our common rootedness to the church as mater et magistra. Chiara's charism of unity is expressed globally under the mater maternal guidance of the church through her teachings. It is this love for the church that Chiara's influence is kept alive in the hearts of the nations. Let me conclude this message with a quote from Pope Francis's address during the Focolari Movement General Assembly. He said, 
I urge you to increasingly promote synodality so that all members as depositories of the same charism may be co-responsible for and participants in the life of the work of Mary and its specific goals. The Focolare Movement and the University of Santo Tomas since 25 years ago has sealed the bond of this partnership and co-responsibility to work together in evangelizing the youth through the charism of unity of the faithful, the faithful apostle of dialogue and model of lay Catholic faith, Chiara Lubick. 25 years ago seemed just like yesterday. What goes around comes around. Today we are back and we are here to make this commemoration in this same, very same hall, the Medicine Auditorium of USD. Truly most meaningful. Welcome to the University of Santo Tomas. This is the speech of our beloved Rector, Richard G. R. Rector Magnificus of the University of Santo Tomas. Thank you for that warm welcome, Father Tiong, in behalf of the very Reverend Father Richard Ang, Director Magnificus of UST. As mentioned, it was St. John Paul II who, in a letter addressed to Chiara and the members of the Focolari movement as Apostles of Dialogue, as reflected in the title of our gathering today. Since her consecration to God almost 80 years ago, which also serves as the founding of the movement, John Paul II said, it has continued growing, all directed to the love of God and to the service of unity in the church and in the world. Now we go back to 1997 and relive the day when Chiara was recognized for her radiating life and inspiring work. In the history of the University of San Tomas, for the first time in its 386 years, it will bestow the honorary doctorate degree in theology to a lay person. For the first time in its 386 years, it will bestow this honor to a woman. And this is the first time that the petition to grant it comes from all the bishops of the Philippines. This is a clear recognition not only of the unique role of the laity and women in the church, but the excellent personality of Chiara Lubic herself. For the past 386 years, the honorary degree in sacred theology was granted by the university to only eight persons. Six are cardinals, one bishop, and one priest. All of these men are known not only for their theological erudition, but for their sanctity. For indeed, theology is supposed to make us not only know God, but to love Him. And if, as St. Thomas says, we become what we love, then theology must also make us God-like, in short, saints. I see some of you smiling. And that is understandable because today, very few of us take sanctity seriously. Sanctity appears to be something out of this world or a quality of the dear departed. 
In our world where the saint is placed on altars, prayed to, sometimes adored, but seldom loved, Chiara Lubick offers us a down-to-earth version of holiness. If we read through the biography of Chiara, we enter a new world where our frail humanity becomes an instrument of grace. The ordinary fusing with the extraordinary, the visible mingling closely with the invisible, and so much love and peace flow out of the pages that our fear of sanctity recedes, and instead comes the nagging challenge, why not I? Indeed, the presence of a holy person makes us ask the question buried under tones of fear, indifference, and anxiety. Why can't I? Why can't I be like Kiana Lubick? Why can I not take seriously the demands of my faith? I believe it is not because we don't know God enough. The honest answer remains, we don't love Him enough. I hope Kiara Lubick's presence in our midst would remind us of that adventure to holiness, to newness, to becoming God's living heart in our homes, schools, office, in every place where we find ourselves. So now with the power best in the family. Kara Lubick served as the president of the Focalara Movement until her death almost 15 years ago on March 14, 2008. She was succeeded by Dr. Maria Boche and now by Ms. Margaret Karam. Margaret Karam was born in Haifa, Israel into a Palestinian Catholic family. Over the years, she has been at the front lines of initiating and encouraging dialogue among peoples. And it is for this work that she was internationally recognized. Dear friends, the president of the Focalara Movement, Ms. Margaret Karam, in her video message. Your Excellencies, Reverend Fathers, brothers and sisters of various churches, dear friends of different religions, ladies and gentlemen, I am very honored to send you a special greeting for this significant event which marks the 25th anniversary of the conferral by the Pontifical University of Santo Thomas of an honoris causa doctorate in Sacred Theology on Chiara Lubick, founder and president of the Focolare Movement. I would like to express my sincere gratitude to the Pontifical University of Santo Tomas and to all the bishops and religious leaders in the Philippines who endorse the conferral of this honorary degree. I feel that this celebration is not only an occasion to remember an event of the past, but it is also an opportunity for us today to once again make Chiara's choice of God and her commitment our own. To spread the light of the charism of unity to every corner of the earth. Please allow me to add a personal note. I am an Arab Christian born in Haifa, in the Holy Land. I was 14 years old when I met the Focolare Movement through a group of young people who attracted my attention because I saw that they lived the Word of God seriously. Jesus, the teacher that Chiara discovered while she was searching for the truth, became my teacher too. Like her, I too wanted to love God immensely and to ensure that He could be loved by as many people as possible. With this new understanding and seeing Kiara's passionate and untiring outreach to all, I could not but believe deeply in dialogue. Giving priority to dialogue bears fruit. It is the privileged way to remove 
prejudices and break down walls. And I would say that more than ever, dialogue should be a factor for change and the only path to reconciliation and forgiveness. I am referring to the many situations of conflict and war going on in different parts of the world. We cannot and will not forget the consequences that these rifts between nations and peoples bring the humanity as a whole. Forced migration, increased poverty in places of the world already tested by climate changes and much more. As we reflect on Chiara's message, it is important to highlight that she envisioned dialogue, first of all, as a gift from God, more than as a human initiative. It is not simply a strategy to create meaningful connections with the other. The foundation of dialogue is Jesus' prayer for unity, that all may be one, which fascinated Chiara ever since the beginning and throughout the years it has motivated the life of the entire Focolare movement. It is a dialogue articulated in three key moments, silence, presence, and friendship. A silence that is more eloquent than words because it allows the other to be heard and to be understood and loved. A presence that leads to encountering the other as a companion in the search of true life, which for us Christians means the presence of Jesus among us, promised to those united in his name. A friendship that comes from meaningful conversation. It is a dialogue that ends in genuine friendship because true friends are best placed to stand together in confronting the great human issues and problems. Chiara's charismatic intuitions gave life to innovative ways of dialogue within the Catholic Church, in the ecumenical world, with the faithful of other religions, and with people who have no religious reference. These intuitions give life as well to what is known as the economy of communion, precisely as a contribution to bringing about greater equality and justice between social classes. In the spirit of this doctorate, I would also like to thank in a special way all the academic authorities for the fruitful collaboration we have with your university and which I hope will progress so that the recognition Chiara received in 1997 does not remain an event, but could be, as Pope Francis would say, the beginning of a process. Thank you for dedicating this celebration to a woman of dialogue who continues to speak to the world today through her writings and talks. I wish you all a wonderful day. May it, may it be for each one and all together, another step ahead in binding peoples together as a family for a future of peace and justice. Thank you, Ms. Karam. One of the many realities of the Focolare movement in the Philippines is the Pag-asa Social Center. For 25 years now, they have extended educational and basic health assistance, as well as other services to indigent families in Tagaytay. Now, we will have their beneficiaries who are part of the Teatro Pagasa to perform for us an artistic presentation on the life of Chiara Lubi.
things fifty falls around me. Constellations forming in the sky above us, they move so slowly. reigned, a charism of unity would arise. Chiara dedicated her whole life to the words of the gospel which she felt we were born to live for. Unity sounds like an extremely broad topic, but she understood that it can be achieved through small contributions united by the same purpose. For her, love was the greatest secret of our times. She understood it was an art that needed practice on our part to reach perfection. She called it the art of loving. 
and it was for this very contribution that she was recognized in 1997. In the video we saw earlier, it was the rector of the University of Santo Tomas at that time who conferred the degree to Chiara and the right person to take us back into that very moment is none other than him. Friends, please join us in welcoming Reverend Father Rolando de la Rosa of the Order of Preachers. Excellencies, Reverend Fathers, Reverend Sisters, members of the Focolare Movement, uh, Andrew, Donnie, and the other officers, adherents, sympathizers of the Focolare Movement, lovers, devotees, and admirers of Chiara. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I know what you're thinking. You must have been thinking, he looks different now. <laughs> After 26 years, look what happened. <laughs> so uh, I'm very thankful for the organizers of this uh, activity because they cropped my picture there in the picture with Chiara. No? So they have no way to compare. But then they showed the video. See? So you know, uh, one of your fellow focolarinas uh, told me a while ago, Father, you look like a Buddha. <laughs> I said, well, that's better. Because my brother, after so many years, without seeing each other, he told me, are you undergoing chemotherapy? <laughs> so, so anyway, so the... In 1997, that was the first time I met Chiara. And regretfully, that was also the last time. I never had the chance to visit her in Rome or to meet her in any of her affairs or meetings or conferences. But she left me something that is worth remembering and which I often tell the Polarini here in the Philippines. She left me a handkerchief. Because when we were about to enter this auditorium, I saw that she was very, uh, and her face was covered with sweat. She was perspiring because we had to walk from the main building to here. So I offered my handkerchief to her because I noticed she didn't bring any. So she took it and uh, I assure you it was very clean. <laughs> was newly washed, newly ironed, and sprayed with little cologne. So she wiped her face with it and then kept it in her pocket. So I told myself, maybe she liked the smell of the cologne. <laughs> Just then, uh, Giovanna Bernuccio, one of the pioneer uh, focolarinas here in the Philippines, came rushing with a bundle of handkerchiefs made of pussy, a native fabric in the Philippines. It was embroidered. So she took one, Chiara, wiped her face and then gave it to me. 
I, you know, for 26 years, I kept that in my wallet. It's still with me, if you like to see it after the program, I'll show it to you. Yes. <laughs> and uh, I don't know, since the time I placed it in my wallet, my wallet was never empty of cash. <laughs> so if that is considered, <laughs> that's true. Right? So uh, if that can be considered a miracle, I'll submit that to Rome for her canonization. <laughs> Okay, so, you know, when, uh, when uh, the passing of Chiara uh, was heard all over the world, many people became very sad, especially her admirers, members of the Focolare movement, and the sympathizers of her crusade for unity. And they were asking, what would happen now to the Focolare movement? I remember when St. Dominic was dying, he told his fellow Dominicans, I will be more helpful to you dead than alive. I don't know if he really said that. But the fact that the Dominican order continues to flourish until now, I think it's because Saint Dominic really fulfilled his promise to really help us to become true Dominicans according to his own ideals. So I think there's no reason to be sad about the passing of Chiara, which actually will sell, we will commemorate two days from now, no? March 14. Uh, yes, March 14. There's no reason to be sad because Chiara did not really disappear. She just assumed a new kind of presence which is no longer bound by the limitations of time and space. So now, I'm going to share with you insights, not anymore about the personality of Chiara, but about you, Focolarinos, Focolarinas, and what you can do to continue the legacy of Chiara, especially in the Philippine context. So, in the, in the audience with the Focolarini by Pope Francis on February 6, 2021, he told the Focolarini gathered there, I urge the Focolari movement to promote synodality so that all members as depositories of the same charism may be co-responsible for and participate in the life of the work of Mary and its specific goals. Everybody now in the church, or almost everyone, is talking about synodality. You know, this is a process begun by Pope Francis in order to make the church more synodal. See, and what does that mean? The three hallmarks of the synodal church, communion, participation, and mission. Can you see it? Yeah. Ah, okay. So let's take communion, one heart, one mind. And the real inspiration to that is from Jesus, who wanted all of us to be one. And as you can see in the Acts of the Apostles, the way they are described, the early Christian community, now the entire group of those who believed were one heart and mind, and no one claimed any possession as his own, but instead they held everything in common. And Tertullian, an early church father, said that non-believers would observe the fast-growing Christian community and exclaim, See how they love one another. See how they love one another. So in the midst of the raging war, according to Chiara, I carried the book as uh, Father Pablo Chan said, I mean, uh, quoted, I carried the book of the gospel with me to the bomb shelters and read it together with my friends. We learned from it the key foundational ideas of our movement. But what strengthened us more was our daily celebration of the Eucharist through which we experienced the church 
as communion. The Eucharist as the highest or the most sublime expression of church as communion. The, the Eucharist breaks down the walls of hostility that divide us and forms us into a family of disciples that Jesus himself prayed would be indeed one, even as he is one with the Father. That's the prayer of unity, which is loved very much by Chiara, and which inspired her to form or to establish this crusade for unity. So the early Focolarini gathered as a family around the fireplace, which in Italian is Focolare. So the Focolare movement encourages people to live their lives like a family. See? Communion experience as a family. As they gather around a hearth or fireplace, savoring the warmth and light that it generates and bringing this experience to others. Family as the best expression of communion among human beings. You know, when Chiara was asked, a question, what is the, uh, how can you formulate the idea of the Focolari movement in one sentence? He said, were I to leave this earth today and were you to ask me for a final word about what the Focolari ideal is, I would have to say, hoping that it be understood in its deepest sense, be a family. And you know, that sounded prophetic because I read in the New City that on her deathbed, her last words were, Be a family. See? Be a family. And also in one of her writings, Never place any kind of activity, either spiritual or apostolic, before the spirit of being a family with the brothers or sisters with whom you are living. Wherever you go to spread the work of Mary, you can do no better than to try to create with discretion and prudence, but with solid conviction, the spirit of a family. Here it echoes the essence of the late, one of the latest encyclicals of Pope Francis, Amoris Laetitia, about the human family. Pope Francis wrote, The church is a family of families. A family is a domestic church where members experience the love and communion present in the divine persons of the Holy Family. So what permeates every true family, every true Christian family, is Trinitarian love. But this Trinitarian love, if we come to think of it, is actually a very complex but simple matter. I often ask myself, why is God one? And why is it also three persons? Simply, God is one, or maybe very simplistically, but for me that's the best way I understand it. God is one because He is love. And it is the nature of love to unite the lover with the beloved. But without dissolving the personality of each one, of, of the lover with the beloved. So in other words, Trinitarian love is balanced by respect or reverence. Without respect, there can be no real love. That's why in our society, charity is balanced by justice. See? Justice, respect, creates the necessary distance so that we see the other person as other, not as a reflection or extension of ourselves. The other person is subject of his own rights and privileges, which we can never violate. I think this is the same Trinitarian love that should permeate the Focolare family. That's why Pope Francis in that same audience said, Beware of the tendency to defend the movement to the detriment of our or respect for individual members and which can also lead to justifying or covering up forms of abuse, mixing up the sphere of government and the sphere of, ex of conscience gives rise to abuses of power and other abuses we have witnessed in other movements. So the first 
synodal characteristics or hallmark that the focolare movement should have, according to Pope Francis, is communion. Now, the second which I'll join in to participation and mission. So why do we need to participate in the evangelizing mission of the church? Well, recall what Jesus said to St. Peter. Peter, do you love me more than this? Three times he asked that. And in the last question, Peter, do you love me more than this? And Peter said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. Okay, so in the focolare context, we measure the intensity of our love for Jesus by our willingness to love others, serve them, and bring them closer to him. In other words, we express our love for Jesus by participating in his mission of redemption. And that is, I think, what Chiara had done in her lifetime. So when she came here to the Philippines, she said, the Philippines is the spiritual oil well for the rest of Asia. Imagine that great hope that she had for us Filipinos, Filipino focolarini. And you know, even the church itself says, the Catholic Church has called on the Filipino Catholics to become the major evangelizers of the rest of Asia. We are the only Catholic nation in Asia. And right now, or rather as of 2019, there are 108 million Filipinos. And 82.9% of these are Catholics. Okay? So our Catholic population is 86.4 million. And the diocesan and secular priests, 9,474 only. That's why one priest had to minister, has to minister to 9,122 Catholics. Imagine. That's why you can see the priests and bishops here. They all look very dilapidated. Joke. <laughs> okay, so in Metro Manila, it's even worse. See, one priest serves 24,109 Catholics. See, one uh, glimpse of hope that we can see is there are increasing religious in number of religious institutes and societies of women. There are 325 of them now. And the total number of religious sisters is 12,255. So you can say, mas marami sila than the priests. No? But then, in 2006, there were already 12,000 102 religious sisters. That means the increase in number is only 133 or not even 12 sisters every year. So there's also a crisis of vocation, see? So those of you who want to become religious priests and sisters, you're still very welcome, no? But I don't think that's necessary. So you see the priests and religious, they only comprise that very small portion of the pie. Whereas the lay people, 99.9% lay people, that is the Catholic Church. So that is why today, in pursuing its mission, the Church shows not only preferential option for the laity, but also preferential reliance on their charism and initiative. See, we need you. You are the future of the church. Not we priests, sisters, nuns. Okay? Because, you know, many lay people, when there's something wrong happening, they will say, what's the church doing? Well, actually, they should ask, what are we doing? See, because they're the Catholic Church. The problem is, the self-understanding of many Catholic lay people today is like this. I am a Catholic because I believe in God and I try my best to do good and avoid evil. But I don't need to follow everything that the church tells me. I am sure God is with me even if I seldom go to church. For them, believing is more important than belonging. See? Unlike 
Protestant sects, their sense of belonging is so strong. That's why when their leader says, for instance, you vote for this guy, all of them will vote for that guy. Whereas when our bishops would say, don't vote for that, <laughs> they would vote for him. <laughs> okay. So today, a big, you're laughing, no? but we're all guilty of this. Today, a big number of lay people is less prone to take the church's hierarchy's word as final and executory. They have privately accepted a compromise. They remain Catholics, but they don't buy the whole package. The result is what we now call cafeteria Catholicism. And what is that? Many Catholics will say, I believe in that, I believe in that, but not that, no? I'll pass on that. See? So they choose what they want to believe in. That's just like when you are in a fast food, okay, or in a cafeteria. So many have departed from the teachings of the Church on Birth Control, Abortion, Capital Punishment, Same-Sex Marriage, and other teachings. This mentality is aggravated by the clergy scandals and cover-ups that give lapsed Catholics added ammunition against their fight against some church doctrines that they disapprove. So my dear Focolarini's Catholic population, 86.4 million. Remember this, number is power. See? As of 2021, the Focolari movement has a presence in over 180 countries with an estimated membership of over 140,000 people. The movement operates in various fields such as education, as you can see represented in the presentation a while ago. And in the Philippines, there are around 5,000 committed members and around 100,000 sympathizers and adherents. However, numer numerical visibility does not translate necessarily into presence. See? Many of us are like ostriches. When there are challenges confronting us, we play the ostrich. We hide our head in the sand. Just like this guy. No? <laughs> he refuses to see the obvious. Imagine if the Catholic Church is composed of people like this. No? Yeah. <laughs> so my dear brothers we can, sisters, we cannot be bystanders anymore. See, bystanders, one who does nothing or simply looks away even when he sees that the situation needs to be changed. Either you are an agent of change or a victim of change. See, be an upstander, not a bystander. An upstander is one who stands up for what is true and good, and one who stands up to create the necessary changes in himself and in others. You know, when God wants to change something in you, it is because He wants you to change others also. So make your presence felt. See, presence means availability. See, it's not just being there, but available. Just as what you did now here. It would have been very easy for Andrew to just send you emails about our talks. But Jesus did not say, where two or three emails are gathered in my name, I am there in their midst. No? He said, where two or three of you, there is no substitute. There is no substitute to physical presence in developing a community, a family, or even engaging in dialogue. See, availability means to be there, body and soul, in whatever place or situation one is needed. Now today, especially among the young people, the symbol of loving presence or availability is the heart. That's why they all say, mm, no? They don't say anymore, I love you. They say, mm. <laughs> and then the Koreans came and they said, mm. <laughs> they made it very little already. No? The heart, imagine, is now the heart. And when you do like that, it's money. No? <laughs> and, so the symbol of loving presence is the heart. But I think for Kiara, it is not the heart. The symbol of loving presence is the cross. Why? Because the heart can stop beating anytime. 
like Jesus on the cross, never stops loving. See? So that's why in one of her writings, he said, Jesus crucified and forsaken is present everywhere, even in those places where we never think to find him. There is no pain and suffering that he has not known and transformed through his passion, death, and resurrection. Recognizing his presence everywhere affirms that his love is beyond space and time. Jesus crucified on the cross. She also wrote, when we have known suffering in all its most frightful forms, in the most varied kinds of anguish, and have stretched out our arms to God in mute, heart-rending supplication, uttering subdued cries for help, then God shows us a new way of looking at our pain. We see something more precious than what we suffer, love in the form of mercy. The love that stretches our arms to embrace all those who, like us, have been ravaged by the tragedies of life. And as Pope Francis said again in that audience, you must remain in imitation of your founder's Chiara Lubich, to be attentive to the cry of abandonment of Jesus forsaken. This manifests the highest measure of love and arouses in us generous and sometimes heroic responses. You know, we Filipinos have a close affinity with the focolare because the focolare, as its name, is the work of Mary, no? Opus Marie. No? Yung isa, Opus Dei. <laughs> Kayo, Opus Marie. No? So the work of Mary. Okay. So we Filipinos love Mary. So I think Focolari movement has a very good environment to flourish here. We love Mary not only because she is the mother of Jesus, but because throughout our history, she helped us maintain and develop our Catholic faith. So when our, our faith, our beliefs have been threatened by secularism, materialism, our devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary helped us maintain our Catholic faith. And if I would like, if you allow me, I would like to cite one instance in our history where our love and devotion for Mary was really shown as a powerful means of social transformation. That is, the EDSA revolution. So they say it's EDSA people power revolution. But for me, it's a revelation. Okay, why? Because in that event, we reveal to the world that when we bring our Catholic faith out of the private, individual, interior and spiritual realm and like Mary make it bear on the everyday realities that we encounter our faith becomes a potent force for social transformation so my dear Focolarinis Chiara's challenge to all of you today as you help realize synodality in the churches be a family imbued with sincere love and mutual respect for one another. Stand up for what is true and right, even if it means persecution, for only through this can you be transfigured into the likeness of Jesus Christ. Be an upstander, not a bystander. And every day, pray the prayer to Mary, which Chiara herself composed. She said, Mary, you are the mother of Jesus and our mother too. Help us to be open to the action of the Holy Spirit so that we may be able to welcome Jesus in our lives and live and love as he did. Mary, teach us to be one heart and one soul, united in love with you and with all humanity, in the heart of Jesus, in the love of the Father, and in the light of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Father De La Rosa, for your encouragement.
and for giving us a glimpse of that historical event. Kara's life feud is a call for all. Everyone, for everyone, with everyone. Because of this, dialogue was of utmost importance to her. In this first video, we will watch Kara as she shared some points on how we can transcend boundaries of differences in religion. This will be followed by a video greeting from Dr. Kezevino Aram, the founder of the Shanti Ashram movement, which draws inspiration from Mahatma Gandhi's vision of progress. In 2001, they recognized Kiara for being a defender of peace. Despite everything, and almost paradoxically, the world is tending towards unity and therefore towards peace. It's a sign of the times. Fortunately, Kiara has shown us the way. Today I understand her religion is only love, and this is why we can meet and dialogue. Only the person who has experienced God can do so. Encuentro exactamente lo que me dijo frente a la menorá. Esto es un pacto, un pacto de buena voluntad, un pacto de fe, una forma de mirar el futuro. Kiara Lubick's entire life shows her as a woman of dialogue and encounter. The first time she perceived the importance of openness to other faiths was in the 1960s on meeting the Bangwa people in Fontaine, Cameroon. I had an intuition. It was as if God was embracing all of us there together. It was then that the idea first came to me that we should have something to do with interreligious dialogue. In 1977 in London, where she was awarded the Templeton Prize for Progress in Religion, Kara felt she received confirmation of what she had perceived in Fontaine. I remember how intently everyone was listening as I spoke of my experience, which is also universal, and how at the end, the first people who came to congratulate me were those of other religions. So I began to realize, perhaps our movement is also meant to have fellowship with them. There, a journey in interreligious dialogue began that brought Kara to speak first to thousands of Buddhists in Japan and later in Thailand, to Muslims in a mosque in Harlem, New York, to Jews in Argentina, and Hindus in the heart of India. What links us to them? We are bound together by what's known as the Golden Rule. It's in the Gospel, but it's found in the sacred texts of almost all other religions. It says, don't do to others what you would not have them do to you, so treat them well, love them. So I, a Christian, love you. You, a Muslim, love me. You love someone who is Jewish. The Jewish person loves you. This is how a sense of family grows. Universal fellowship. She transcended boundaries, but she was able to go beyond the nationalities, cross people at a real human level, to uplift everyone spiritually. I think that was her gift. One of the most significant examples of interreligious dialogue is the experience that has evolved within the movement in Algeria since the 1970s. Christians and Muslims have traveled together on a path based on the spirituality of unity. Dialogue is very fruitful, because in dialogue we put ourselves on the same level as our partner, and we want to get to know them. They speak, and as we listen, we enculturate ourselves and understand them. We also see how to express our faith in their terms. Of course, when our dialogue partner feels all this love, they realize their own dignity and also want to listen. I think our boundary is really to do with being without boundaries. This means being able to give a soul to globalization, 
That is why we need a universal sense of family everywhere. I feel this is my task for as long as I live, and it's the task of the movement. This is God's plan for humanity, to be one family with one father, and to achieve it together with everyone else who is working towards this goal. It's a very happy occasion for us. We are celebrating the 25th anniversary of the conferment uh, of the honorary doctorate on our beloved Piera. Uh, this doctorate was on sacred theology. Uh, but as I gather with the Focolare movement to celebrate this moment, I also want to thank uh, the former rector and the current rector of the University of St. Thomas for doing this. Because uh, while celebrating and, and conferring this honorary doctorate, they were celebrating three very important dimensions of the gifts that Kiera offered to the world. The first one, and, and I'm never tired of speaking about this, is the prophetic voice of a 19-year-old young woman. A young woman who showed the world that there is a path to live one's faith. And this prophetic voice is what has moved me, it has intrigued me, it has made me think what is its relevance today. A young woman who in the middle of suffering, deep suffering when the world war was affecting every part of the world, particularly Italy where she lived in, she saw there was a way to live her faith. She did that in a way that was so simple and yet so profound, together with her friends all young women, they started discovering what it meant to live united, what it meant to live love concretely. And here is where the deep lessons of, of, of religion, of religious life comes into the forefront. To be responsive to the needs of people and yet being able to live what one believes in. So brothers and sisters, as we celebrate this 25th anniversary, may I remind you of that prophetic voice of a 19-year-old young girl. A moment in history where it was not usual for the world to pause and listen to a young person and definitely not usual for the world to listen to the voice of a woman. She was a forerunner. She was a pioneer in the way the image of leadership and leadership that was grounded in values and faith uh, and this image is why I think we have a lesson to take forward. The second thing which is equally very close to my heart is the universal dimension of her life and her work. Mahatma Gandhi said, I don't want my house, the walls to encompass everything. I don't want the windows to stifle my thought and my views and my experience. He said, I want it to be open. I want good things and good experiences, new things and new learnings to come from everywhere. Yet Mahatma Gandhi said, I want to be anchored in my faith. I want to be anchored in my culture because Gandhiji again said, the culture of a nation, the culture of a society resides in the hearts and the minds of people. And what did Kiara do? She lived both these dimensions. She went deeper into her own faith and we know the beautiful and very powerful experience she had in Toradiko. But she was yet open to the richness and the bounty of the world. She knew even then that one did not have to live an exclusive life. The dialogue and dialogue with other cultures and other religions was a way to live this universal dimension of love. And this brings me to the final dimension that I want to celebrate with you and that is the dimension and the power of dialogue. Not always wanting to arrive at a destination but to be able to speak, to be able to share, to be able to feel that oneness uh, which is grounded, which is rooted in mutual respect. I saw that as a young woman in Kiara. When she called me, she called me to speak about what we could do together. When she called me and asked about my religion and culture, I was just a beginner 
I was learning about my tradition in a deeper way. But when she did that, she allowed for generations to meet. And I hope today, when we look back at the life of Kiara, we don't forget that young woman who gave leadership to the world, but we also don't forget that experienced leader who was ever open to speak to generations, who was ever open to take in what was the beauty of the world, but also, in a way, free to share, like many elders in India, the richness and goodness of life. And this is where Mahatma Gandhi gives the words that I think is so relevant um, to, to celebrate. What we do today will determine our tomorrow. May we continue to be apostles of dialogue, apostles of love, and take forward this commitment to living in a harmonious and a more united society. Kara Lubin proposed the art of loving as a key to achieve a more united world. She shared it to countless families here in the Philippines, in India, and other parts of the world. She said, and I quote, We need to spread love, that reciprocal love which generates brotherhood. We need to invade the world with love, and we need to begin with ourselves, end quote. All the sacred books, Karen notes, contain the golden rule, which, when summarized, means respect for one's neighbors. Furthermore, Karen said, in order to respect them, we must love them. This love gives much joy to those who put it into practice. It also asks for commitment, courage, and constant practice. It is not possible to build peace without sacrifice. In this next segment, we will hear songs and experiences from people who are able to break barriers of division by loving concretely.
is Giovanni, and this is my wife, Marge, and we are with our daughters, Luce and Luna. We are from Sulyap uh, ng Pag-asa Housing, a Focolare community in Quezon City. After leaving the prison, I was 
Empress na naman ang Empress of God, continue to care for me. Soon after, I do decided to do what the volunteers did for me in prison, to bring Jesus to those left behind. Two years ago, I joined again a cooperative which was organized to help release prisoners and their families to get back on their feet by producing novelty and liturgical titles. Inspired by the way of life I've learned from the Fokulari, I wanted to share with them my corporate experience, especially in the field of human relationship. My hope was to help the community of release inmates to improve their lives, not just only financially, but also spiritually through the life of unity and the art of loving. The cooperative which was I managing was in survival mode. It had been losing money because the pandemic stopped its activities. Another Jesus for second. In December, a trusted salesperson was part of our management team, was discovered to be diverting his sales collections to his bank and Jika's account. In the art of loving, Kiara teaches us to see Jesus in our brother and to forgive. So one day, we decided to visit the salesperson and announce at his home. When we meet him, we were not prepared for what we saw. He was very thin and weak, with terminal kidney failure. Only the dialysis three times a week keeps him alive. Everyone saw Jesus in him and felt not hate, but love, compassion, and forgiveness. Through him, God is never a darkness in the city. We face with love all our adversities and survive. This year, for the first time in our 29 years of operations, we achieved the highest level of sales and net surplus. Praise the Lord. And yesterday, we have our general assembly. Because of what had happened, the board of directors decided that I have to pay those. But God is good. The general assembly decided na hindi na ako pababayan sa account. So maraming salamat. Kiara, Mama Mary, and Jesus Christ. Thank you. Who can say that mental health is not important? Mental health is everyone's concern and it is important as physical health. Mental health in the Philippines, which is highly stigmatized and always plagued by misconceptions according to studies, has given space and spotlight, especially during the COVID pandemic. I am Mark Joseph e. Lorenzo, a guidance counselor and educator. The reason why I pursue counseling in graduate studies is that I face various concerns about the problems of my learners. Not only with the problems of my learners, their studies, and family problems. There were also times even the parents of my learners came to me and asked for help or advice. One of the prerequisites of my dissertation writing is to undergo a supervised internship at InTouch Community Services. After weeks of intensive training at the clinic, I encountered a variety of mental health concerns such as depression, anxiety, panic attacks, stress and anger, work-related problems, relationships, family or couple concerns, and issues affecting the LGBTQIA+. I had a call that I will never forget. The caller, the caller shared that he was having problems with his family, work, and he had just gone through a breakup with a vulnerable relationship. We went to a problem talk. When I heard these words, pagod na pagod na ako. I'm so tired. Ubus na ubus na ako. I am so exhausted. I already sensed that his concern could lead to a life-threatening situation. I asked him what these words mean, and he shared that he really wanted to commit suicide during the time we were on the phone. 
When I asked where he was, I found out that he was on the highway and he wanted to cross the highway with speeding cars. I asked for his, uh, I asked him a favor to go to a safe place and he responded my real request. I asked for his phone number and permission to call him just in case the call was connect disconnected but he never gave me his consent. So I shared the safety protocol. Talk and be with your closest person to accompany you at the moment. Or you may opt to go to the nearest emergency room of a hospital, barangay, or police station. As I was saying this, he interrupted me and said, Ibababa ko na muna ang call. Talagang init na init na talaga ako sa sarili ko. Gustong gusto ko siya talagang gawin. He ended the call. I do not know what he will do. I have been waiting 5, 10, then 15 minutes for a call back from him. Then a few more minutes, I received a call. He informed me that he went to the police station. He said he knows a policeman who was on duty at the station at the time. He shared that his friends went to the police station and they said that they will accompany him until he gets better. He was grateful for the help I gave as he did not expect that there would be a person that would be willing to give a little time to listen to him. He thanked the crisis hotline for having that kind of service without payment in return. For him, the service is very important because it helps many people in need, especially in mental health. One important thing that I would always apply whenever I engage in a call is to make a conscious effort that those who call are persons in need of my attention. So I make sure that I listen wholeheartedly, validate their worries, appreciate their for reaching out, and explore their possible resources, friends, and support. For me, this is my opportunity to live the gospel. Do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, because I do not know these people, and all their calls are free and anonymous. This is where I see my self-actualization as a person, that transcendence. Uh, this is also where I can live, and what I've learned from the spirituality of the Fakolare, sharing the hearts and joys of the others. Here, I am being able to first to love, love everyone, and be uh, and love the other as myself. Through this unconditional service I offer to the persons in crisis, I became an instrument in saving in the lives of persons in our community. Thank you for listening. Experiences. Truly, as Kara said, the love that we must put into practice is a special love. This is a love that is expressed concretely, not only with words, but with facts. We can begin at once to love in the way the art of loving suggests, in our families, at school, in the neighborhoods of our cities, everywhere, so that, touched by this love, everyone will radiate the same love to others. An act of love could begin with a simple smile, or knowing the person next to you, sharing your food, or priori prioritizing the elderly and taking the elevator. Your act of love could begin here and now. As we go for a short break, here are some practical announcements. Our distinguished guests are requested to proceed at the reception room. Kindly follow the ushers designated as they accompany you. Eating inside the auditorium is strictly prohibited. You may take your snacks along the corridors, outside the hall, and the rest of the building. You may also proceed to the lobby and kiosks downstairs. Restrooms are located on the left and right sides of this floor and the floor below. You may exit through the doors.
Yeah. I would like to send a message to our friends in India in a very special way, which is also part of our newly merged area, territory, zone, call it whatever you wish. So I'll say it in Hindi in order to make it easier for him, for them. Main hamare bhaiyon aur hamare behnon ke India mein rehte hain, inko salam kehna chahta hoon, aur hum inki ye is talk inke saath dedicate karna chahte hain. Okay, and I'll try to in Tagalog. Mabuhay tayong lahat. Your Excellency Charles J. Brown, bishops, reverend pastors, brothers and sisters from various religions, religious traditions, and all those present here, those following also online. It is with immense gratitude to God that we as co-delegates of the Focolare Movement here in the Philippines and in the Indian subcontinent address this august gathering. We are deeply moved to be in this very hall that saw the servant of God, Kara Lubick, being honored 25 years ago by this esteemed institution, the University of Santo Tomas, for her contribution to sacred theology. This year, 2023, also marks the 80th anniversary of the Focolare Movement, founded by Kara Lubick. Certainly, these anniversaries present a unique opportunity to acknowledge the gift that Kiara Lubick is for us. But the light given to her extends beyond the boundaries of the movement, encouraging and inspiring many people in every part of the world. We hope that during this year, through the various events being offered even here at USD, many may have the chance to discover new inspirations for their life and work, so that together we may continue the legacy of Chiara, of being people of dialogue. The challenges we face today as individuals and as a community are no less significant than those Chiara had to face when she and her friends started out during the Second World War with most of them being only in their early 20s. Her message of dialogue is ever more relevant in a world that yearns for unity amidst ongoing polarizations that are tearing relationships apart. We are just coming out of the COVID pandemic, a health crisis with unimaginable consequences that have shaken the entire world destabilizing our ordinary lives, disturbing the apparent tranquility of even the most privileged societies, generating disorientation and suffering. Surely, none of us in this auditorium has emerged untouched. We are still feeling the repercussions of the pandemic that has brought with it a strong sense of isolation, loneliness, mental health issues in people, especially in the youth, children, and teens who have found their, their safe, space, safe spaces alone within their rooms, devoid of tangible and meaningful relationships. There is a constantly growing threat to peace, but both locally and internationally. And unfortunately, there seems to be little effort to dialogue and to address these issues. In his Christmas message in 2021, Pope Francis criticized the increasing polarization in personal, personal and interpersonal international relationships, saying that only dialogue can resolve conflicts, <coughs> ranging from family disputes to threats of war. He said, our capacity for social relationship is sorely tried. There is a growing tendency to withdraw, to do it all by, by ourselves, to stop making an effort to encounter others and do things together. On the international level too, he said, there is the risk of avoiding dialogue, the risk that this complex crisis 
will lead to taking shortcuts rather than setting out on the longer paths of dialogue. Yet, only those paths can lead to the resolution of conflicts and lasting benefits for all. We could list a number of challenges, from social inequalities to environmental issues, that could make us question, is dialogue relevant today? Definitely yes. We should never get tired of repeating the word dialogue. As our pontiff urges us, we need to promote a culture of dialogue by every possible means in order to rebuild the fabric of society. Therefore, faced with this state of the world, we are called to put into action new strategies and a new commitment to build relationships and reach the point of establishing true universal brotherhood. Now, in order to achieve such a great global purpose, all of us must give our own irreplaceable contribution. Where can we start? As people of faith, we are called to be involved together with all men and women loved by God, who are committed to solidarity, peace, harmony, and justice. Although, although we are different, we share the golden rule present in our sacred scriptures, do to others as you would have them do to you, an ethical and spiritual norm that is too often forgotten. Here we realize that Kara Lubeck's intuitions take on great importance precisely in this context, and that our experience of dialogue can offer answers which may be small, but are concrete. Chiara made Jesus' prayer, may they all be one, the motto of her life. This can be translated into living for universal brotherhood. And she invited millions of people to commit to this goal so as to achieve it. In this context, dialogue revealed in its infinite applications is a fundamental an essential aspect. Indeed, dialogue is the only path that can be followed with the hope of success for those who want to contribute to the fulfillment of universal brotherhood. Dialogue is a new lifestyle, a new culture that the Focolare seeks to offer to all men and women, along with others, of course. St. John Paul II acknowledged this characteristic in his letter to Chiara Lubick, dated 4th December 20, 2003, saying, In unison with the magisterium of the Church, the members of the Focolare movement have become apostles of dialogue, the privileged way to promote unity. Dialogue within the Church, ecumenical and interreligious dialogue, dialogue with non-believers. Hence, we rightfully call Chiara Lubick, founder of the Focolare movement, an apostle of dialogue. If we examine the specific characteristics of dialogue as it is carried out in the movement, the first characteristic can be seen in its foundation. Chiara always taught us to look at, to God as the one father of all, and as a result, to see every man or every woman we meet as her son as his son or daughter, and therefore our brother or sister. Chiara wrote to her companions in 1947, and I quote, Before all else, the soul must always fix its gaze on the one father of many children. Then it must see all as children of the same father. In mind and heart, we must always go beyond the bounds, the bounds imposed on us by human life alone and create the habit of constantly opening ourselves to the reality of being one human family in one Father, God. If this is the foundation, the dialogical method that Chiara taught us cannot be anything other than love. <clears throat> it is a dialogue among brothers and sisters, therefore a dialogue among people and not between ideologies or thought systems. Dialogue must necessarily be supported and sustained by mercy, compassion, and love. Once this is put at the base of dialogue, 
not only with people see or mm -hmm. people we, we see and we meet in a new light, but also discover the diversity as a gift. Kiara said, the person next to me was created as a gift for me. And I was created as a gift for the person next to me. On earth, all stands in a relationship of love with all. Each thing with each thing. We have to be love, capital L. However, to discover the golden thread among <coughs> all things that exist. Nowadays, our connections have multiplied thanks to the social media, but these have become short, ephemeral, and lacking in content, while at the same time, relationships break down or diminish. Only when, I, when the I-U relationship includes a love that goes beyond purely natural dimensions, can connections be transformed into relationships and we can truly build networks of brotherhood. In this regard, religion has a role to play in giving meaning and a soul to the world today. Over the years, we have seen the irreplaceable role of religions, that is, to lead their faithful to acknowledge and respect one another, to collaborate and take lead in building a peaceful world where justice and respect for the human person prevail. Kiara Lubick inspired many to take off on a divine adventure of love, but not any kind of love. It is a love rooted in the gospel, a love that is an art, which she called the art of loving. For example, love everyone means do not discriminate. It is a love that is directed not only to our relatives and friends, but to everyone the rich and the poor, those of our own religion or of another religion. Love always. This kind of love urges us to love in every circumstance. Be the first to love. This love always takes the initiative without expecting to be loved or get something in return. Concrete love entails making ourselves one with others to, list, to live the others in a certain way, by sharing their sufferings, their joys, in order to understand them, to serve and help them concretely with deeds. It is a matter of momentarily putting aside our own ideas, worries, in order to make space for others out of love. By doing so, we assume an attitude of listening and learning, and there is always something to learn. If we were to live this art of loving, we would be practicing some of the indispensable principles of dialogue among persons, people, and religions. We will mention just a few. The art of loving leads us to welcome every person with full respect, acknowledging his or her richness as a gift. This brings, out, or this brings about unity in diversity. Evidently, proselytism and syncretism are incompatible with this lifestyle. This way of living fosters a reciprocity in relationships, where each person is not only enriched by diversity in itself, but finds an opportunity to deepen one's own knowledge and faith in relationship with the other. As Mahatma Gandhi would say, I should love all people, but all of them, regardless of their faith, so that they become better people, thanks to their contact with one another. If this happens, then the world will be a better place to live in. On a wider scale, the art of loving promotes social cohesion founded on equality of, in our shared human dignity. This resonates with Chiara Lubick's charism of unity and universal brotherhood. The spirituality that developed from this charism has shown us that unity in God's plan for the whole of humanity throughout its history. 
Let's look at the world we live in, which we spoke about at the, at the start. How can we face all the troubles of this world? How can we solve its problems? Wherever we are, we can be instruments of unity and dialogue. Here is what Chiara said in 1981, which is so true even today. Before all else, God wants from us that we bring to life mutual love, creating everywhere living cells, which are groups of people united by love, in families, in offices, factories, schools, parishes, parliaments, monasteries and convents, to feed a fire of love for God in the church and in society. Experiences that we have all heard earlier show that it is always possible to light fires of love in all these places and keep them burning. And we can do this through dialogue, which is never abstract, but always a meeting with people, with brothers and sisters to love. Our goal is to live according to God's plan, that of making the whole of humanity one family. Again, we quote Gandhi, who said, the golden way is to be friends with the world and to regard the whole human family as one. We have a great responsibility then, but we are certain that God will help us at every stage, in every effort, inspiring us with the right ideas, the most useful intuitions, in an atmosphere of joy and fraternity that is already here among us. Thank you very Thank much. You.
Father Andrew, Miss Cheryl Ann, and to the Salterian Choir for singing Higit sa Isang Pamana, or More Than a Legacy. Thanks to Kiara's ingenuity, we realize that unity is the plan of God for all humanity throughout history. And so, understanding our responsibility, we must ask ourselves, how can we contribute to the fulfillment of this beautiful plan? We had such a beautiful morning together, and what better way to cap off this morning's program than to hear from the President of the Catholic Bishops' Conference of the Philippines, His Excellency Most Reverend Pablo Virgilio David. Bishop Ambo has prepared a short video for this occasion. Dear brothers and sisters in the Lord, especially our beloved papal nuncio, Archbishop Charles John Brown, the Dominican Fathers, especially Father Richard Ang and Father Rolando de la Rosa, present and former rectors of UST, the administrators, faculty members, and students of the University of Santo Tomas, and our dear, dear friends in the Popolari Movement, headed by your president, Ms. Margaret Karam, Ladies and gentlemen, magandang umaga po sa inyo lahat. Good morning, everyone. You know, I was really hoping I could be there personally to deliver this message on behalf of the Catholic Bishops' Conference of the Philippines. Unfortunately, this event has coincided with my 40th anniversary in the Presbyteral Ministry. And I have been asked by our clergy, friends, and family to celebrate Mass with them and join them for lunch. It would have been such a great pleasure to celebrate with you the work of the Holy Spirit through the charism of unity in the life and work of the servant of God, Chiara Lubit. As president of the CDCP, I wish to convey our appreciation for this initiative to commemorate the silver anniversary of the awarding of a doctorate honoris causa in sacred theology by the University of Santo Tomas to the servant of God, Chiara Lubic. One of the things I fervently pray for, you know, is the speedy advancement of the cause for the beatification and the eventual canonization of Chiara Lubic. The manner in which this woman's holy life has impacted the world, including the Philippines through the Focolare movement, is something I can personally attest. Chiara could serve as one of the best sources of inspiration for what Pope Francis calls the need for greater synodality in the church. Let me just give three reasons why. First of all, way ahead of her time, long before Vatican II was convened, Chiara already lived out her vocation to be an apostle of dialogue, which is one of the most fundamental principles of synodality. Her concept of a true Christian community was one that consciously promoted basic human communities that were ready to make space, not just for fellow Catholics, but also for fellow Christians of other traditions and denominations in the spirit of ecumenism. But she pushed this even further to openness for conviviality, not just with fellow Christians, but also with fellow believers from other faith communities in the spirit of interreligious and intercultural dialogue. Finally, she worked for unity, not just with fellow Christians and fellow believers, but with every human being, every person of good will. Now, secondly, Chiara consistently invited people to draw strength and nurture faith, hope, and love by leading them to the word of life, made flesh in Jesus of Nazareth. In the word of life, she had found her pearl of great price, the binding force that could bring people together in a common journey towards a civilization of love. At a time when the world 
was being torn apart by darkness during the Second World War, by gloom and chaos, the chaos of conflict and hatred, Kiara brought people together around the fire of God's love burning in the word of life. And thirdly, in the same spirit of synodality, Kiara promoted the communion of goods and became a countersign against the world that was fast being seduced by the disvalues of individualism, hedonism, and materialism. As a woman and as a lay person, she lived out the synodal principles of participation and mission, grounded in communion of mind, heart, and soul in the God who is love, made known to us in Jesus Christ. The only revolution that Chiara promoted was the revolution of love. She proclaimed love as the only impetus for change in the world. With these humble thoughts, I wish you all a meaningful day. May all of you who have drawn inspiration and strength from Chiara's life and mission as a true disciple of Christ and apostle of dialogue and synodality be truly blessed and be a source of blessing to the world. This is your fellow servant of the word of life, Pablo Virgilio David, Bishop of Francocan and President of the Catholic Bishops' Conference of the Philippines. Thank you. We would like to express our heartfelt thanks to our friends and guests belonging to various Christian churches and world religions. As your church or religion is called, may we request that you stand up to be recognized. The Holy Orthodox Catholic Apostolic Church of Jesus Christ. The Iglesia Unida Ecumenical. The, the Iglesia Filipina Independiente. The United Church of Christ in the Philippines. The Episcopal Church in the Philippines. The Philippine Council of Evangelical Churches. The United Methodist Church. The Southern Tagalog Regional Ecumenical Movement. and the Rizal Ecumenical Movement. Our dear friends from various Christian churches are invited to a moment of encounter with Ms. Jane Roble and Mr. Robert Samson after the group photo, after which you will be guided to the venue by a bus downstairs. We would like to extend the same gratitude to our friends and guests belonging to various world religions. Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And for those who are not able to mention, please stand up to be acknowledged. The Church of Jesus Christ Messenger. Thank you. Our guests from these world religions are invited to a moment of encounter with Mr. Ted and Mrs. Acela Arago. After the group photo, participants of these moments of encounter are requested to proceed to the door on your left, 
where the Philippine flag is, and from there you will be guided by your ushers to the venue. A bus is waiting for you at the ground floor to bring to your designated rooms. We also thank our sponsors and donors, including the Food People Incorporated, maker of FIC Fruits and Ice Cream, Yakult Philippines Incorporated, manufacturer and distributor of Yakult, the original probiotic drink, Kara 2300 Incorporated, and top ever Marine Management Philippine Corporation. We are also grateful for the support of the Minor Basilica of the Black Nazarene in Quiapo, Manila. <laughs> Likewise, our deep gratitude to the members and adherents of the Focolare movement, as well as their families and friends who wholeheartedly supported this event. This event will not be possible, and we really mean this. This event will not be possible if it were not for the unparalleled generosity extended by the Pontifical and Royal University of Santo Tomas. A big, big thank you 